He has forbidden his governors to pass laws of immediate and pressing importance unless suspended in their operation till his assent should be obtained. And when so suspended, he has utterly neglected to attend to them. Now, again, he's not allowing those whom he has uh, uh, put in charge or those that the people have elected to be in charge. He's not allow allowing them to, to uh, do their job. He's refused to pass other laws for the accommodation of large districts of people unless those people would relinquish the right of representation in the legislature or right inestimable, inestimable to them and formidable to tyrants only. In other words, as the colonies were growing and new districts were growing and people lived in there, then those people were uh, wanting to be represented by the legislature, the colonial legislature. And King George was saying, no, they don't, they don't get represented. They don't have a voice. And so that, like they're saying, King George is... He's by this time, kings don't have the absolute authority to say and do anything they want. The kings themselves must follow certain rules. And now it's gotten to the point where King Charles in England, I mean, it's a it's a ceremonial position. It's a position that the British people are not willing to give up. It's part of their tradition. They're very proud of it. Um, he does have certain formal responsibilities. He's the one that initiates uh, the parliamentary session every year and so on. And there's, I don't know what all powers he has and doesn't have, but King Charles or King George had some powers here, but the rest of them were held in the hands of Parliament and he was not even allowing the, the colonies to come up with laws to legislate law and order in the colonies. And, and so basically he said, since they're not a real part of England, I'm going to rule over them and do what I want to. And you can't do that. Uh, the biggest thing that I think he did wrong um, Let's see here. No, not that one. Not that one. Not that one. Not that one. Okay. He has abdicated government here by declaring us out of his protection and waging war against us. Remember what authority represents. Authority and protection go together. If you're the king, then it's your responsibility to protect the people that are under you. When you voluntarily refuse not only to protect them but then hire soldiers to go to war against them and what he did was he hired a band of mercenaries called the hessians they were like germans and he hired these german mercenaries to come to the colonies and wage war against the people and at so I, I kind of struggle for a long time. Take your Bible, turn to Rev. Uh, let's see here. Let's let's go ahead and go to um, Revelation, if you would. Uh, the Book of Revelation, and um, several years ago, back in fact, many years ago, uh, I was studying. You know, about our nation, uh, about our country, whether or not, you know, I'd heard some people say our country is illegitimate and blah, blah, blah. Uh, but I, it took me a while because God was teaching me about realms of authority. And I didn't understand all the reasons why the Declaration of Independence was written. I didn't understand it. And why, basically, they were separating themselves from England and becoming their own sovereign nation. In other words, they were, they were, they were rebelling against King George and the, the King of England. And I'm going, you know, rebellion is the sin of witchcraft. 
And I just, I don't know, I had a problem with that. But then, and I remembered some things from, you know, my teaching in school and so on. And um, then when I understood and read what I just read here, that not only did King George abdicate his protection um, over the colonies, and that he actually hired mercenaries, the Hessian soldiers, to come and basically wage war against the colonies that are supposed to be, if a foreign nation came in and was attacking the colonies, King George should have then ordered British troops and British naval ships to blockade the colonies and fight against the Hessian soldiers to put or allow the colonies to take up arms and protect themselves. He was doing neither. He, he was forbidding the, col the colonists from taking up arms and uh, he would not, um, would not allow that. And then he would not allow his red colt soldiers to fight against the Hessians. So in other words, he tells the Hessians, kill every American that you want to and take whatever you want. And that's what they were doing. So at that time, King George, by action, abdicated his authority over those colonies because authority is protection. The two always go together. And so um, when, I, when, it, when, it, when that hit me, then I started looking at the other things that he was doing. And basically, he had, he had abdicated his authority over the colonies, if you read the declaration, he abdicated his authority. And they said, they pled with him multiple times. And he, and he wouldn't hear it, wouldn't listen to him, wouldn't do anything about it. And so finally they said, we don't have a choice. If we're going to survive here, if we're going to keep, keep even our very lives here, uh, we're going to have to do something different besides him being our sovereign. So that's what I believe he did. All right, Revelation chapter 17. The reason why I bring this up already tonight is in Ephesians, we're studying the mysteries. Now, this will be the final uh, of the mysteries. This will be the last one that's mentioned in the scriptures. In other words, we tried to follow the order of the scriptures. And last, um, last Sunday night, we got into the a little bit of the understanding of Revelation chapter 10 and um, in the, you know, in the days of the voice of the seventh angel, when he shall begin to sound, the mystery of God should be finished as he hath declared to his servants, the prophets. Now, um, some people ask me, Pastor Mike, do you believe the book of Revelation was written in chronological order? I don't, I, I can't say yes to that. I really can't say yes to that. I think some things are chronological. Uh, the order of the trumpets. If this, if this is the first trumpet and this is the sixth trumpet, then obviously the sixth trumpet comes after the first trumpet. But I can't say that everything in the book of Revelation goes from day one uh, of year one to the last day of year seven, the way a lot of people have it worked out in their heads. Um, I think there's a lot of crossover of information is, is what I think. And do I have it all figured out? No. So... You just read your Bible and you'll be fine, all right? But anyway, so we have the, even though we have the mystery of God finished in Revelation 10, in Revelation 17, John is being shown now this woman and her name is mystery. And then he says, I will show you the mystery of the woman. So in my mind, when the seventh trumpet sounds or begins to sound part of the mystery of this woman is her destruction okay her power taken away and actually the ten horns on the beast those ten kings they hate her god puts it in their heart and they hate her and they're going we're going to kill her boom and so i it's very possible that even though this is mentioned after what's in Revelation 10, that this happens at the time of Revelation 10. 
or somewhere around in there. Any, anyway, it's a mystery. I'll tell you that. All right, Revelation chapter 17. Let's go to the Lord in prayer and uh, uh, pray for the, uh, those who are still sick. Pray for those uh, who are struggling. Pray for the message this morning that God will work it inside the hearts. And we still have a lot to go on powers. I may, I may, care, I may preach powers for another month. Who knows? That would be up to the Lord, but we need it. Father, we ask your blessings now upon uh, this teaching tonight. And as we go through uh, this, perhaps one of the greatest mysteries in the Bible is the, the mystery of iniquity, the understanding, the identification of the beast. We don't know who it is. We don't know... Uh, much about him other than what your word says and what your word says, Lord, we can't, we can't see it too well. Uh, some people, Father, think they've already got it figured out and I wouldn't dare. And Father, then the mystery of, of Babylon and who she is and what she's responsible or what, what she does. So Lord, just guide us as we go through your scriptures, line upon line, line upon line, precept upon precept. Here a little and there a little and give us understanding, Lord, as we go through this journey uh, of here a little and there a little. And God, just take the little that you give us each and every day and let it uh, build us up, Lord, uh, and make us more in your image every day. Thank you for this book. It's it is absolutely amazing to all of us. So we thank you, Father, for it. And we ask your blessings on your word in Jesus' name. And all of God's people said, Amen. All right, Revelation chapter 17, verse 1. And there came one of the seven angels, which had the seven vials. These are the vials of wrath. And the vials, when the vials of wrath are going to be poured out, that's it. I mean, that's it. I mean, this is the wrath of God. Clearly, God's saints are in total protection during that time. For God has not appointed us unto wrath. Uh, so anyway, he says, uh, He talked with me, saying unto me, Come hither, and I will show unto thee the judgment of the great whore that sitteth upon many waters, with whom the kings of the earth have committed fornication, and the inhabitants of the earth have made uh, have been made drunk with the wine of her fornication. I mentioned a little bit about that during the message this morning. Uh, I absolutely believe a, a pedophile network exists amongst very powerful, high-ranking people in this country. I think that if all the names were to come out who are involved in this, I think America would absolutely, it would make them, now I'll say this, the sad thing is, I think that there are large parts of America that would defend these people. And say, well, who's to say who they can love and who they can't love? Because that's coming. That's coming. Uh, but anyway, and there's actually something about Babylon that follows that line. But anyway, I mentioned uh, the, the inhabitants have been made drunk with the wine of her fornication. Um, and that this same pedophile network knows fully well and understands fully well how they can get drunk from drinking the blood of these children. It, it's, I, I didn't believe it at first. I thought this is another internet um, nonsense. I'm not buying into it. And then I read the scriptures and I went, wait a minute. So I do. I, absolutely. I think there's something to it. 
uh, with whom the kings of the earth have, been, have committed fornication, the inhabitants of the earth have been made drunk with the wine of her fornication. So he carried me away in the spirit into where? Into the wilderness. Now remember, let's, um, let's take our Bibles. Let's go to, and I'm going to use this one because I always, I need, it's a brand new Bible, so I got to get all the pages unlocked from each other. There we go. Turn to Isaiah 13. Isaiah 13. Look at verse 19. Babylon, the glory of kingdoms, the beauty of the Chaldees' excellency, shall be as when God overthrew Sodom and Gomorrah. It shall never be inhabited, neither shall it be dwelt in from generation to generation. Neither shall the Arabian pitch tent there, neither shall the shepherds make their fold there. But wild beasts of the desert shall lie there, and their houses shall be full of doleful creatures. And owls shall dwell there, and satyrs shall dance there. Wild beasts of the islands shall cry in their desolate houses, and dragons in their pleasant palaces, and her time is near to come, and her days not prolonged. In other words, she has made a, a, a desolate, desolate wilderness. If you turn to uh, Isaiah 34, which is not going to be easy in this Bible... But I got to get through the pages. Isaiah 34 uh, basically says the same thing. Um, let's see here. Verse 1, come near ye nations to hear and hearken ye people and let the earth hear and all that is therein the world and all things that come forth of it for the indignation of the Lord is upon all nations and is a fury upon all their armies and he hath utterly destroyed them he hath delivered them to the slaughter. Uh, let's see here. The host of heaven in verse 4 is going to be dissolved. Um, and here, if you look at verse 4, you've got Revelation 6 right here. The heavens shall be rolled together as a scroll, and their host shall fall down, as a leaf falleth from off the vine, as a falling fig from the fig tree. That's the opening of the sixth seal right there. Uh, and then you get down to... Um, Verse 9, the streams thereof shall be turned into pitch. What is pitch? Tar. Oil. Tar. And the dust thereof into brimstone, and the land thereof shall become burning pitch, like Sodom. It shall not be quenched night nor day. The smoke thereof shall go up forever from generation to generation. It shall lie waste. None shall, so there's waste right there, a wasteland. None shall pass through it forever and ever. Uh, and then you have the mentioning of the various creatures that are there, the cormorant, the bittern, the owl, the raven. Um, and I like this, verse 11. He shall stretch out upon it the line of confusion and the stones of emptiness. That's in 11. 11 is the number for confusion. So we have the, the line of confusion, the stones of emptiness. Now, it's possible, he says, he shall stretch out upon it the line of confusion uh, even today when carpenters, Matthew, what do carpenters do when they have a, an angled cut that they want to make in wood or drywall? What do they use to, huh? Not a square. They use a chalk what? Chalk line. And they snap that chalk line and that makes their, their line that they're going to follow for cutting. But in this case here, stretch out upon it the line of confusion. In other words, the line isn't straight. Uh, the city is messed up. Um, there's nothing square about it. There's nothing right about it. In Amos, God put forth a, uh, um, a, a, a plumb bob. He said, I, I've set this plumb in the midst of my people. This plumb line in the midst of my people. He basically is showing that since gravity never lies, because it's a law made by God, gravity never lies, gravity doesn't bend, Gra gravity doesn't whatever, you set a plumb line in the midst of people, and what are the people going to look like measured up against the plumb line? Crooked. When people measure themselves with each other, we try to find out who stands up the straightest. But even that person, when you measure them up against God's plumb line, they're crooked. 
Every one of us are. So that's, that's a little bit of uh, Babylon there, the line of confusion, the stones of emptiness. In other words, it's chaos is what it is. It's chaos. There's emptiness there. There's chaos there. There's no rules. Sort of like the quantum realm. Okay, I don't want to get into that, but uh, you see in verse 13, thorns shall come up in her palaces, nettles and brambles in the fortress thereof, and it shall be an habitation of dragons and a court for owls. The wild beasts of the desert shall also meet with the wild beasts of the island. And the satyr shall cry to his fellow, the screech owl, and sh shall rest there and find herself a place of rest. Uh, there shall the great owl make her nest and lay and hatch and gather under her shadow. There shall the vultures also be gathered, every one with her mate. And the opposite of that is, seek ye out the book of the Lord and read. No one of these shall fail, none shall want her mate. From my mouth it hath commanded, and his spirit it hath gathered them, and uh, so on. So, uh, back to Revelation 17, uh, in order to show him fully what Babylon is all about, we got to take you where Babylon is. Babylon is going to be in the wilderness. Any place that is a wilderness... Any place not inhabited by, and we always, uh, uh, or I've always taught, any place in the absence of the man, Jesus Christ, where he's not there, it's a wilderness. She's there. And all the things that go with her. So, um, he carried me away in the spirit into the wilderness, and sure enough, I saw a woman sit upon a scarlet colored beast full of names of blasphemy. Who is this beast? Huh? The Antichrist from Revelation 13. Remember, he's scarlet colored. Um, he has the names of blasphemy written on his head. And uh, having seven heads and ten horns, so he has that. The woman was arrayed in purple and scarlet color and decked with gold and precious stones and pearls. Having upon her forehead uh, was a name written, Mystery Babylon the Great, the mother of harlots and abominations of the earth. If we get back to verse 4, what the woman was arrayed in, I want you to think about this, okay? And this is why, this is why the Apostle Paul um, tells, tells ladies, um, to be careful how you present yourself in your dress, in your hair, uh, in, in, uh, your jewelry. Now, is God against different hairstyles? Is God against jewelry? Is God against, against nice clothing on a, well, no, of course he's not. Uh, we see that he arrays the bride in Revelation 19 with this beautiful linen, fine linen, white and clean. We see in, in Ezekiel 16 where he arrays Jerusalem. Uh, he, had, he puts a, 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 he puts a, a ring or a, or a jewel around her head. He does what? Puts rings on her fingers and bells on her toes and whatever. But he adorns her, and which is the husband's prerogative. Um, you know, I know my wife likes jewelry. Um, I like to please my wife. I like to make her happy. And so sometimes I'll pick something out. Sometimes I'll let her pick it out. But I think my wife looks pretty when she has her jewelry on uh, and so on. I think she looks pretty and that's that's my prerogative i'm the husband i can do that now if some other guy starts trying to buy my wife jewelry i'm gonna find out why amen don't we'll find out why in a hurry um so anyway but that i mean i like that on her there's certain ways i like my wife to look and uh, I think my wife, to this day, a very beautiful woman. I, I don't know she ended, how I ended up with her, I, gosh, I don't know. God was sure good to me. But anyway, but this woman 
has arrayed herself in purple, scarlet color, decked with gold and precious stones and pearls. In other words, that is her draw. That's how she gets everybody to think of her and notice her. Okay? Um, when we go to... Um, when we go to Mufon, there's a couple ladies that show up there, older women, and they're just all decked out, okay, with all this stuff there. They're, number one, they're crazy. <laughs> Not for believing in UFOs, but for what they believe about UFOs. Uh, but you can tell that they are led by a spirit, okay, Babylonian spirit. They like the, the jewelry. They like the gold. They like the, the beautiful feminine clothes. You know, I, I, nowadays, I think it's nice when a woman actually likes to dress like a woman. Okay, but then there's, there's carrying it too far. And so when the Apostle Paul laid out these, these guidelines, he, was, he could not have any way been saying, no, you cannot wear these at all. He's just saying, if that's who you are and that's all you got, you ain't got much. And if that's, and if what you're doing and what you're wearing has one purpose in mind, and that is to draw a man's eyes to your body and to your face and whatever it is, it's the wrong thing. You know, I, I, over the years, I've tried to tell uh, preaching at, you know, maybe preaching at camp or preaching here and trying to preach to, to teenage girls. You girls know, I've never been a teenage girl, honestly, in my life. Never one time. But I'm pretty sure I think I know that when you put certain clothes on, you know what you're doing. Did I get it right? Okay, not too many things I get right about women, but that one I'm pretty sure I got. Uh, I noticed, this is years ago, when we were going like the Missouri camp, for some reason, uh, it, was, it was girls who were wearing uh, jeans or pants where when they sat down just right, you could see their panties, the back of their panties. And I figured, man, they got to be doing that on purpose. Because you just don't go around showing everybody your underwear. But uh, I remember uh, Joe Pogue invited us down to uh, Farmington Church. And he invited me to preach to the young people down there. And I brought that up. And I want to tell you, I got some looks of hate. The worst one I got was from a young preacher. Believe it or not, he was listed as one of the Missouri contacts for Rick Warren's youth programs. Free Will Baptist preacher. He was furious at me for preaching that. And I'm going, what, you don't think it's a problem? I think it's a huge problem. But anyway, this is her, okay? Uh, intention does have something to do with it. You intend to go out looking modest, looking decent. You'll go out looking modest, looking decent. If you intend to go out looking in a way to where you want somebody's eyes upon you, whether it's male or female or whatever, if you want women to be jealous and you just want men to stare at you, then... You are getting what you're asking for and don't get upset when you find some men staring at you. What are you looking at? You know exactly what they're looking at. So anyway, this is how she is. Because in her hand is a golden cup. And it's full of abominations. So anything in the Bible that God says is abomination... Probably in that cup. Filthiness of her fornication is in that cup. 
And to whomever she gives it to drink, that spirit poured into those people. So now think of this. I, it's been a while since I taught on this, but any kind of spiritual drunkenness, whether it comes in the form of the charismatics who literally promote what they call being drunk in the spirit. They literally promote that concept. Guys like Kenneth Hagin uh, telling people um, that on the day of Pentecost, they were, they were saying uh, these men, they accused them of acting like drunks. And he said, why did they accuse them of acting like drunks? They, because they were drunk. They were acting drunk. And then he went to what Paul said, I think, to Timothy. Be not drunk with wine wherein is excess, but be filled with the Spirit. Hagen deliberately changed that passage to be not drunk with wine, be, but be ye filled, be ye drunk with the Spirit. He added, be ye drunk with the Spirit. And then he started talking about how drunks act. Drunks fall down. Drunks reel around. And by the time he's getting into this, all of the actors, and they were actors, because on the front pews of this church, he had everybody's names where he, where he wanted everybody to sit. He wanted Kenneth Copeland to sit here, his wife sit next to him, and he had all these names, which the Bible said you're not supposed to do. You're not supposed to dictate in the church who gets to sit where. Amen. James said that. But you had all the actors, the people that he knew would go along with what he was trying to show everybody. Those who would act drunk at his request. And they did it. And then you had all the people in the back following in that because they felt that it was the right thing to do. Plus, I think a spirit was there on them as well. And sadly, my girls got to meet her. Um, uh, Donna Douglas, who played Ellie Mae on Beverly Hillbillies. She um, supposedly left Hollywood for Christianity, but she fell into the charismatic movement. And in this video, she's there in, in that crowd. Not in the pile that's on the floor. But you, I mean, you see her hair, it's her. If I showed it to you, you'd say, yeah, that's her. Okay. So anyway, so there is that type of drunkenness, but there is also a type of drunkenness where you wouldn't necessarily act physically in a drunken matter. You would be drunk in a way spiritually to where your eyes wouldn't be able to see scriptures right. You won't understand doctrine. You won't understand judgment. You won't be able to tell between clean and unclean, between right and wrong. You won't be able to teach them to your children. All of these things the Bible talks about when, when someone is drunk or a spirit of drunkenness has been poured out to people. They, they cannot walk straight. They cannot stand straight. They cannot see straight. Uh, and then everything, all tables are full of vomit. So in other words, they turn the table of the Lord into an unclean thing because of their vomit. Um, and, and it's because of her spirit. And I'll never forget, um, years ago, um, I, I, I wanted to be one of the speakers for the Prophecy Club, Stan Johnson, back in the 90s. And finally, about 2002... Uh, I sent him a couple of my videos um, on Freemasonry. He loved it. He called me, put you on tour. And then while I was on that tour, I was studying um, the uh, Da Vinci Code. And I learned in there um, uh, about uh, the cup of the devils. There's a cup of, there's a God's cup and a cup of devils. And this is her. This is Babylon, a cup of devils. And I said, God's cup makes men sober, but the devil's cup makes men drunk. And so I remember the next time he invited me to do a tour, I was speaking on the Da Vinci Code because it was big back then. Okay. And uh, he wanted everything to be current. So it was current. 
And so I'm de dealing with all this. And so I'm in, um, I, don't, where, I don't know if I was, uh, yeah, I was in Topeka, Kansas, I guess. No, I was, I, was in, um, I was in Dallas where him and his wife had moved to. And they had set up a place there where they had church. And by the way, his wife was the house prophetess. She was the one that basically told everybody what God said. And uh, so I taught that crowd about being drunk in the spirit and, you know, how it's an abomination before God. And, I, and they were talking to me after the meeting. And they, he said, uh, my wife and I looked at each other and kind of giggled. And he said, we both agreed. Well, obviously, he's never been drunk in the spirit. And they were saying that like I needed to be. Because they were. And I'm going, and I never will be. Never will be. So anyway, um, yeah, that was the old days. But all right. Um, now, upon her forehead was a name written mystery. So the biggest thing about Babylon... And why you can see and understand her presence anywhere. If there's anything dealing with a cover up. Anything dealing with um, evil things being kept secret. I mean, think of uh, Achan, who stole the things from Ai, and what did he do with them? Pray, hey, look what I got, guys, look what I got, man. I took this from this dude in, in Ai, man, it's so easy. I, hey, hey, this, this uh, wedge of gold, I'll sell that to you, man. Come on, man. come on, you can buy it from me. He wasn't waving that around, he had to bury it under his tent. The spirit that led him to that secrecy was Babylon. Cover it up. Do you remember when Rachel, before she left, took her dad's idols? And when her dad came back with an army, all with their swords out, saying, uh, somebody from your group stole my idols. And I'm telling you, all my guys are going to line up. They're going to cut. They're going to stab and cut whoever did it. We're going to kill the person who did it. And uh, Jacob said, I'll tell you what, there'll be no need for that. Because I guarantee you, if any of that stuff is with, with any of my people, I'll do the stabbing and cutting for you. So I won't put up with that. Well, lo and behold, it was Rachel. And what she did was, she took the teraphim, the, the idols. She put them in a piece of the camel's furniture, a chest, and then sat on them and pretended to be on her monthly discourse. <laughs> and now what she is, get this now, she, according to the law, she's unclean. She's uh, what does it say there in verse 5? The filthiness. She is full of abominations and filthiness and uncleanness. And when a woman is in, in her flower, the Bible says, she is unclean. And everything that she sitteth upon is unclean. Isn't that interesting? So what is she doing? She is hiding those idols and keeping them secret from her own father. And her father believes her. Oh, daughter, I'm sorry. Can I look under there? Father, please. For I'm in my stage of life and I cannot get up from this seat. So, Father, will you respect that? Sure, daughter, I will. And I just wonder what would happen if he would have found him under there. If he would have killed his own daughter or if uh, Jacob would have killed the one that he had his wages chained ten times to finally be set free from this guy. I just wonder what would have happened. 
But she is playing the part here of, of mystery, Babylon, because she's hiding. The, I think that idol represents the man of sin. He represents the image of the beast. And so, um, you know, I've, you've heard me talk about this book that I've got. And you can get a copy online. You can buy them at bookstores. You can also get a PDF online from dozens of places. Uh, just be careful <laughs> you don't get a virus with it. But uh, it's called The Secret Teachings of All Ages. It's written by a guy, Manley Hall. And here's what I found out about Manley Hall. Manley Hall got an endowment from some very wealthy people. They knew him to be a scholar. They knew him to be a man of, of study. They knew him to be a man who uh, studied mystery religions and mystery cults and things like that. And they gave Manley Hall an endowment. In other words, you know, let's say they said, here's a check for $15 million. Build you a library. Go and use this money to buy every kind of obscure book that you can get your hands on. Study these books. Tell us what they're saying. Because obviously this rich family was trying to figure out what was going on with, I don't know, some mystery in their family or whatever. Um, Robert Bigelow, let me just spend some time with this since it's going to take forever for me to get through this. You ought to see how many notes I've got on just this, this part right here. Okay, probably by 2028 we'll be out of the book of Ephesians, but I'm just, I'm not holding back any promises. But any, because I think this is a big deal to, to talk about. Mystery Babylon is a huge part of what happens in this world, okay? There's, a, there's a, a billionaire by the name of Robert Bigelow. Robert Bigelow, years ago, saw a UFO, and that's always got his interest. Robert Bigelow um, became wealthy in the uh, Las Vegas hotel business. So he had made his billions of dollars as a guy building and owning hotels in Las Vegas. And hotels in Las Vegas are very lucrative places. Um, and so anyway, um, I saw an interview by him. And he's got an interest in UFOs, but it extends way beyond UFOs. It extends into the paranormal, supernatural, poltergeist, ghosts, um, any kind of psychic powers, anything like that. It's, it's taken over his mind. Um, I know that his wife died some years ago, and I think he... Uh, it sounded like he was trying to like get in touch with her and didn't know how to. Um, but anyway, he got a contract with NASA to build these space cubicles for people to live in. And he's made some money off that. On the outside of the building that he uses to build these things is uh, an image of a gray alien's face. That's his company's logo. And uh, he has been read into and shared with some pretty high-level secrets when it comes because of his security status with NASA. He has been informed of some pretty classified things when it comes to UFOs and the supernatural. He bought the um, uh, uh, the the I was trying to say the the, the chain smoker ranch, <laughs> the Skinwalker Ranch. <laughs> chain smoker ranch he bought the skinwalker ranch and he was the first guy to take what was going on at that place seriously he set up at the time the most up-to-date modern um, equipment cameras monitoring stations microphones things that see light spectrums that human eyes cannot see he set up stuff all over that place trying to catch 
supernatural events that take place regularly at that ranch. And in all the years, 20 years of owning it, never caught anything. And it wasn't that stuff didn't happen. There was some weird, wacky, that people saw with their eyes that when they checked the cameras, the cameras had just gone off for some reason. So, but he's been interested in this. Now, here's something I know about, um, who, who did I just say? Chain, a chain smoker got me messed up. Robert Bigelow. Uh, we have a friend that lives in Las Vegas that knows a lady and is friends with because they share the same ethnic background who was Robert Bigelow's housekeeper. And she basically said, Robert Bigelow very seldom ever came home alone at night. When he left his office, very seldom did he come home alone. Now, I'm not saying he's got a girlfriend. But in Vegas, whatever you want, if you've got the money for it, you can get it. He's got the money for it. Okay? And that's his life. So, the spirit that drives Robert Bigelow is Mystery Babylon. But along the same route of that, the spirit that is keeping the truth of what all of this really is, is mystery Babylon. Why do you think that no UFO has ever just outright landed in the middle of New York City's uh, Central Park and waited for the news cameras to show up? Obviously they can, but they don't. Um, what, what spirit do you think is compelling? And we now know this for a fact. This was, this was theorized by UFO people for years, but now we know it for a fact because Congress has admitted it, that they discovered that there was a section of you call it the U.S. government or whatever, but there's a section of people working for a very, very secretive program in the United States government that receives a ton of money every year and Congress didn't even know about it, was never told about it, not even allowed to know its, exi its existence. And now somebody has come forward and Congress is now convinced that this, this group actually exists. They're getting congressional money without congressional oversight. And they work with UAPs, Unknown Aerial Phenomenon. And been, they've been doing this for years. What spirit do you think is behind that mystery? Babylon the Great, the mother of harlots and abominations of the earth. And I could go on and on about her, her presence in UFO encounters. Her, uh, I just, I'm putting out a series. In fact, it's out about how all these Marian apparitions. That's, that's Babylon. That's her. That's not Mary coming back and telling everybody how she hears every, imagine this. If you're a Catholic, you're told to believe that Mary has the same powers of Jesus. That Mary can hear every single prayer that's prayed to her simultaneously and then simultaneously pray for those people to her son Jesus for Jesus to redeem those people. That she has that ability and has that a power. And that she has been appearing in different places all over the earth. And when she appears, she always demands that they build this humongous tabernacle, temple, uh, basilica, in her honor. 
And do you think they build it out of bamboo and straw? No. They get the best uh, materials, the best things in the world and build these huge edifices, these huge buildings, these very rich things covered with gold and stones and pearls and precious stones, just like her. And they have a statue of Mary who appeared in that place, again, decked with gold, precious stones, pearls, looking saintly. That's Mystery Babylon, people. That's her spirit. And um, one last thing, she is drunken with the blood of the saints and with the blood of martyrs of Jesus. And when I saw her, I wondered with great admiration. And by the way, I found out that she's not just drunken with the blood of the saints. Um, she is... Where is it? Uh, no, I, I can't find it. I don't think. Yeah, in her was found the blood of prophets and of saints and of all that were slain upon the earth. I, I would take that to mean everybody that's been murdered, she's drank their blood. That's, yeah, wow. Why do you think God told us not to? Sign number one that you're Babylon. Amen. All right. So we got a lot to go through. What do you find out what that means? La cage a fall. The birdcage. La cage. It's French. There was a French play. Turned into a movie, La Cage. Pardon my French, but all, all fall. The Cage of Birds. They made an American remake of it with Robin Williams. He had a spirit in him. Um, the theater in Tombstone, Arizona, was called the Birdcage Theater. Yeah. So why, why was that? Hmm. Maybe the Bible would tell us. It will. Let's stand. Father, thank you very much for meeting with us tonight, for sharing your wonderful, wonderful word with us. Lord, we enjoy the study of your word. We thank you, God, for it. Uh, Lord, there's nothing more important that we could be doing than studying your word, studying to show ourselves approved, not unto men, but unto God. So bless that word and bless all those who've heard it. And I pray, dear God, that you would open our eyes and help us see things that need to be seen in these days, things that Babylon is hiding. And Lord, though uh, I don't understand every mystery, and I certainly, certainly don't understand every mystery that Babylon is keeping, every secret, uh, Father, Lord, it, um, it brings me joy, it brings me dedication, Father, to want to seek these things out, find out what's really going on. So, Lord, bless your word. Bless it for my sake and my heart and for these people's sakes, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen.